Welcome to The Art of Medicine, the program that explores the arts, business, and clinical aspects of the practice of medicine. My guest today is Dr. Ruth Godian. Welcome, Dr. Godian. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here on The Art of Medicine. Dr. Godian, you are Chief Learning Officer at Weill Cornell Medicine in New York. And you have a new book, it just came out, and that's kind of what excited me. And uh, tell me the title again, because when it I saw is, the title. It's called The Success Factor. Yeah, it's like, okay, I need that. That sounds like a bestseller right off the bat. Success I factor. hope so. <laughs> we all want to be successful, right? And so let's just go back a little bit. Tell me about your training and who you are and what you do and why you decided to spend, I know when I write a book, it takes me two to three years. It's a big, people don't realize, oh, it's just a little book. I read it, you know, in two days, but it's a big commitment, right? Yes. And, uh, so <laughs> you, you must have been highly motivated to do it. So, so tell me about how you got there. The whole story. Well, I'll back up saying my bachelor's and master's is actually in business. And I dipped my toe in finance and international banking for a couple of years but really missed academia, really missed working with students. I didn't want to work with undergrads. I had done that and felt like there were a lot of disciplinary issues. And I really wanted to try the graduate level. Like toddlers. <laughs> and I said, who has the most to lose? And then I realized MD, PhD students have the most to lose. So I am going to run that program. So that's what I did for 22 years was I ran an MD PhD program at Wall Cornell Rockefeller and Sloan Kettering, really did everything cradle to grave, recruitment, admission, student affairs, budgets, operations, fundraising, marketing, alumni affairs, wow. social media, you name it, I did it. Everything except for financial aid because we pay them, right? <laughs> um, their MD and their PhD is covered through that grant that we need to write through that NIH grant. But I started seeing as I was with these, the, these students who were the best of the best, the program had a three and a half percent acceptance rate. You have a better chance of getting into Stanford than you do into this program. So for but, 100 applicants, you take three. Is that, that's that right. Three and a half applicants. Yep, well, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and so the chances are slim. And I realized even amongst this elite group, there were those who were rising to the top. But what was happening was that all of the national attention, all of the conferences we were going to, the NIH developed um, workforce studies to look at this task forces, why so many physician scientists were leaving the pipeline. Hmm. And I was convinced that we were looking at the wrong end of the pipeline. I thought we should be looking at those who are so successful that their work more than makes up for anybody who wants to leave the profession. So at the age of 43, while working full time and raising my family, I decided let's go back to school and get a doctorate and study it. And my doctorate was literally on optimizing success of physician scientists. And since then I've included astronauts and Olympic champions and CEOs and all other great high achievers. Right, high achievers. So there are people who seem to rise above the rest. Yes. And uh, well, it, we'll just cut to the chase here. I, is there anything special or do they just work harder? You no, know? they work smarter, that's for sure. Um, but they definitely do things differently because you could be very smart and very talented and still not rise to the top. We know plenty of people like that. We all do. But all of these extreme high achievers, and it didn't matter if you were a Nobel Prize winning scientist or if you were a gold medal Olympic figure skater. It was the same thing with all of these people, with all of these high achievers. They found something, first of all, they all did four things in common, but they found something that they love doing and they cannot see themselves doing anything else. This is literally what they were put on this earth to do. And every time I asked them, this is what kept coming up over and over again. I have this fire in my belly. I would do it for free if I could. 
And it's so interesting because when I ran the MD PhD program, and remember it's a seven to eight year marathon to get those two degrees, every so often somebody would wanna leave. And I would literally pull out their admission essay, their AMCAS admission essay that said, why do you wanna be a doctor? Why do you wanna be a physician scientist? Just to remind them of their why. Mm. And that why, because, I mean, you've probably read thousands of these essays before. It's something that happened to someone that inspired them to go into this profession. Sometimes people just needed reminders of what those things were. So they tapped into their intrinsic motivation. And that, that is the first spark. The second one is, as you said, did they outwork everyone? Well, yes and no. They outworked everyone, but they worked much smarter than everyone else because they actually realized that their downtime was just as important as their work time. And they leverage the work time. So if they know that they're more focused in the early hours, they're not having meetings during those early hours. They controlled their schedule as much as they could. And they said no more than they said yes. So for example, Dr. Bob Lefkowitz, who's the 2012 Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, he turned down dean roles, he turned down department chair roles, he was focused on his science, that's all he wanted to do. So it's learning how to say no as much as being strategic about what you say yes to. And then the third thing is that they have a very strong foundation, which they are constantly reinforcing. What they did early in their careers, they did later in their careers. So for example, every year when the Nobel Prize announcements come out in October, which is when I wake up at four o'clock in the morning because I want to watch those live, I'm so excited. You see there's always pictures on Twitter of here's someone who just got the Nobel Prize, but they still have to submit their grant because it's due today, or they're still lecturing because they're supposed to teach a class today and they are not giving that up. Same things they did early in their career, they did later in their career. And that doesn't matter if you're a Nobel Prize winning scientist or someone like Neil Katyal, who argued 45 cases before the Supreme Court, they have the same things that they do all the time. And last but not least, they are constantly learning and they're learning through informal means. So um, it could be that they're going to conferences, they're reading books or reading articles or talking to other people because high achievers surround themselves with a team of mentors who can always support them and guide them and give them perspective. So those are the four things. Okay, I like it. I like it. I, th <laughs> I think those are those all resonate with me as as correct. For example, uh, I've always been very impressed by uh, performers, say Madonna or Tony Bennett, right? Mm -hmm. Who are still performing, you know, grueling schedules, uh, just, you know, until their last breath. They're yes. obviously not doing it for the money, right? That's right? I mean, they have enough money and they could be sitting, you know, drinking tequilas all day, you know, in their uh, villa in Mexico if they wanted to, but they're not. They're in a bus on tour, singing every other night. Um, you can see that, that that is within them, right? That was the, and I, I liked your comment that he would do it, even if you could do it, even if they weren't paying me, right? That's right. You know, I tell everyone the astronauts are government workers. They're not making so much money, but this is what they have to do. They feel that they must do it. And something that Dr. Tony Fauci told me, he said, I asked him, I said, how do you pick which projects to work on? And he said to me, and this, my mentor told me the same thing, actually. He said, Tony Fauci said, do something important, not just interesting. Because if it's important, it will have an impact. If it's interesting, it's just a hobby to you. Mm -hmm. And you went into whatever field you went into in order to have an impact on other people. So what's the way that you can have an impact? Good stuff, right? Right, it's <laughs> different for each, each. So, you know, I think a lot of people have trouble though discovering what their passion, talent is. Yes, correct. That's true? That's absolutely correct. You know, as children, 
we, we had um, uniforms for every possible sport event, right? Whatever it is, karate, baseball, ballet, gymnastics, whatever it is, you had multiple uniforms, but we don't try different things as we become adults. And we need to start figuring it out. And we also need to start figuring out and understanding that just because you're good at something doesn't mean you love it. So you remember I told you I was good at finance. I worked in international banking and I could have stayed there forever, but I didn't love it. And I would have started resenting it. So there's actually ways to figure out what you're good at, what you are good at, but don't enjoy. What do you not enjoy and often procrastinate doing? And what are the things that you love so much you would do for free if you could? So when I talk to people, I actually take them through a passion audit to figure out what those things are. And the passion audit is something very simple that anybody can do. And I actually suggest to people that every time you have a transition, a new job, another child, a pandemic, whatever it is, you pull out that passion audit and reassess if that's really appropriate and right, or if you need to make some changes to it. So if any of your listeners want to download a passion audit, they can just get it right from my website, which is ruthgotian.com slash passion audit, one word. Perfect. I will put that in the uh, show notes. And for those who are watching on YouTube, you'll see it right in front of you. So that's good. Well, it sounds like every high school student should have at least an hour with you uh, <laughs> to uh, sort this out because I think people kind of stumble around a lot. And your comment that just because you're good at it doesn't mean you should do it, I think also has the converse is just because you're passionate about it doesn't mean you're good at it. Yes, (laughs) so uh, true. You know, uh, I wanted to be a professional musician and uh, when I was in high school and I played the piano and I sang. But once I got out, actually, once I got to college and I went to music classes with the sort of a higher level of talent, I realized that I was nowhere near where I felt I needed to be to excel. For me, it was very important to excel. If I was going to choose something as my life's work, I better be good at it. And I was kind of at the bottom of the pack when it came to voice and, you know, talent. It's like it was very humbling and I was quite saddened for a few days to realize that my uh, talent was not equivalent to my passion. Well, you know what, but but that's interesting because that reminds me of one of the stories in the success factor of Joe Jacoby. Joe Jacoby um, won the gold medal in canoe kayak at the Olympics in Barcelona. And he was actually, he picked up on the sport when he was a 10 or 12 year old at summer camp. And he lived in DC, so he was able to kayak there. And he quickly became world champion level. And he would train with the other world champions. But he said on that same river, you can't shut down a river. That same river, there was some other guy who was, he said, likely in his 40s, just training just to stay in shape. And he loved it. Mm. But for him, it was a hobby. But what he did very intelligently was that he was training right next to the world champions. So that made him much better because when you surround yourself with people who are better than you, that raises the bar of what is expected and what is good. If you're going to the Olympic village gym, you're not going to walk in with a box of donuts. You're just not going to do it because you know, everyone there is super focused and every second counts and the bar is raised so high. That's why you surround yourself with people who are better than you, who can always teach you something. And that's the story of Joe Jacoby. So for say physicians in practice, you know, they're all already kind of made big decisions. I'm going to be a neurologist or a gastroenterologist. And, yes. you know, sometimes after five or 10 or 15 years, you're not so sure that it's so your, your passion may not still be as passionate as you were when you started. You might have some doubts. How, How do you sort all that out? So that's an interesting question. I think this is where the team of mentors is really helpful. They remind you why you get into there. Sometimes you're so deep inside the jar 
that you can't even read the label. So you need people who are surrounding yourself. So even if you like you, you're a neurologist and the type of work you were doing as a neurologist just may not excite you anymore. They can first of all, tell you what other options are there for you to consider. Maybe you've been seeing patients and you want to do more administrative work, or you want to start doing clinical trials, or you want to start teaching the medical students, or you want to start mentoring. I mean, there's no shortage of things. Medicine is its own institution. There's so many things that you can do. And what's so great is for people who are working in healthcare, they have the opportunity to meet people who are doing all these other things. And all it takes is one conversation to ask how did you get here? How did you know that this was the path that you wanted to try? And having that conversation might spark something in you to start thinking about, hmm, I wonder if I can try that. Now, as someone who's written a few books, I was very interested at the other people that you interviewed, you know, a lot of pretty mm -hmm. famous people. So I how do, you, how do you get in touch with them and say, hey, I want to sit down with you for an hour. And do you just do it over the phone? Do you drive up to their house? Do you bring a tape recorder? You know, I'm interested in actually the, the granular uh, way to do that. How do yes. You so it, there are a lot of really famous people in the book, a lot of household names, as well as some people that you've never heard of that have done incredible things. Because of my work with the MD PhD program, because I was working at these really prestigious institutions, I had access to a lot of Nobel Prize winners. And then once people know, like, and trust you, when you say, I really would like to interview more, could you recommend any to me? They would make those warm introductions. So 90, 95% of those who I interviewed were through warm introductions. Now, pre-pandemic, pre-Zoom, if I could do it in person, I did it in person if they were local. Otherwise, it was by phone with this special attachment to record it. It was a whole thing. Um, afterwards, there were obviously we, as technology advanced, there were different kinds of interviews that we could do, including some on Zoom. Um, astronauts, I met one astronaut at a conference, 700 people there. He was on a panel at the end of the panel. I went right up to him, found a common denominator that we can, we can talk about. And he introduced me to a few other astronaut friends. And um, what was very interesting was I was asked to present my research um, somewhere and there happened to be an astronaut in the audience. And at the end he said, well, I'm an astronaut, why didn't you interview me? <laughs> so that got me to a few others. And then with the Olympians, I met one and he introduced me to others. So all you need is one. And once you get that, it's, uh, and then when people start hearing that this is what you're doing, I think they wanna introduce you to people who they know. So all of a sudden people were introducing me to more people than I could even interview. So maybe that'll be volume two. Ah, perfect, perfect. And, and I'll just mention uh, for the uh, listeners that I have it, I think there are at least two of these programs now on space medicine. I've been to Houston and to NASA, and I've interviewed one of the physicians who takes care of the astronauts, you know, when they're in the oh, uh, yeah. station. And that was pretty cool. So uh, I'm, yeah. I'm hoping to get an astronaut on, on this program uh, soon. So when we hang up, I may ask you for a warm <laughs> What, one of the astronauts who's a physician who's in the book is Scott Parazinski. He's actually very interesting because he's a physician. He actually started as an MD, PhD, but then wound up doing just MD. Also, an Olympic coach in Luge, while he was in medical student um, at Stanford, he was trying out to be an Olympian in Luge, but then didn't, he got close, but didn't make it and then uh, became a coach for someone in the Philippines. And he climbed Mount Everest. So there you go. Physician, no, just, just astronaut, a regular, just a regular guy. I told you I interviewed extreme high achievers. So they are probably pretty high on the talent scale, just, you know, right out of the, out of the gate, their genetics is such, I mean, not everybody can climb out Mount Everest. Well, yes and no. So one of the other people who I interviewed, he's not an Olympic champion, but I thought the story was so unique that I had to include it. And that's Devin Harris. Devin Harris was a member of the original Jamaican bobsledding team. So if you ever saw the movie Cool Runnings, 
that was about the story of the Jamaican bobsledding team. They never got a medal. They were never contenders for the medal. Just getting to the Olympics was the win for them. And I thought what it took to get to that point, there were so many important stories there. It's more than talent. You need so much more than talent. It's what you do with it and who you surround yourself with and how you cultivate it and how you learn to make things better so you can be better, smarter, faster, more efficient, more effective. That's what's really so important. Raw talent is great, but it's not enough. The, the word perseverance comes to mind. I, yes. I suspect that's a quality they they all share. What about defining success? Do, <laughs> do, they, do they define it for themselves? Or, you know, like you want to be a doctor, you know, your mother wanted you to be a doctor and your uncle wanted you to be a doctor. So, oh, maybe I'll be a doctor. How, yeah. how, do, how does that work? It's very interesting. So, um, you know, I'm the, I'm the kind of person I straddle two, word, two worlds. I'm an academic, but I also write for lay journals for Forbes and Psych Today. But one of the original, one of the academic writings was about defining success, especially for physician scientists. So um, what we quickly, what I quickly realized when I did the research was that success, the definition of success, it really depends on who you ask. And it differs, and this is a whole other one hour discussion, but it differs on, based on gender and based on rank. That's a whole other discussion. There's an article, anyone who's interested can go in PubMed and can find it. But um, what, when I was looking at people who are, were successful, what really was important was, are these people who have pushed the limits of what we know to be true? Have they created a paradigm shift in the way we look at things or think about things or do things? And also, do they pay it forward? As they're moving up the ranks, are they bringing up other people throughout the ranks or is it all about them? Because if it's all about them, those are not my kind of people. So being a billionaire or being on a, a social media influencer was not my definition of success. But somebody who can really push an idea forward and someone who can really um, just make the world better for other people by actually mentoring other people and bringing other people up and teaching other people things. Those, we need those kind of people in our world. And that was my definition of success. But I wanna tell you a fun fact. When I asked, um, when I would reach out to certain people and I said, you know, you came up on my rankings as a high achiever. And they said, really? And I said, <laughs> you're a Nobel prize winner. If you're not successful, what does that say about the rest of us? So they were deeply, deeply humble. And yes, really in fact, that was going to be my next question is do these successful people consider themselves successful? No, I had to really, really pull it out of them. In fact, um, what's interesting, um, and I talk about how humble they are in, in the book, The Success Factor, with a lot of examples from Nobel Prize winners who have pictures of themselves with former US presidents, not even framed, just thrown on the bookshelf, like it's no big deal, right? Like it's grandma. But I'm like, this, this was the president of the United States. No, nope. it's just thrown on there. Um, and it's interesting, the Olympians at the end, I always ask to see their medals and I ask which is their favorite only two of them had it on display. Everyone else, it's in a box under the bed. It's in a safe. A few of them had it in a brown paper bag. Apollo Ono, most decorated winter Olympian, had it in a brown paper bag in the sock drawer. Another one had it in a brown paper bag in the nightstand. I said, why? I would be sleeping with it. He said, you don't understand. This is a chapter in my life. It's not my entire story. And that's why they didn't crumble because it was never about the medal. It was never about that. And that's why there's not a single Nobel prize winning scientist who quit doing science just because they won the Nobel. That's why they keep going. Is it a more about the challenge? Do you think that it's not so much that there's an award, but it's like, you know, maybe I can run a four minute mile like, uh, 
the, the, the guy who did it for the fir very first time, you know, it, it was, it, do, they, do they see becoming a millionaire or successful in whatever they're doing as a challenge, something to sort of achieve, or it's just their passion? It's going back to their passion. So if they are looking for a treatment, for a prevention, they likely will never get there in their lifetime, but they are very much aware that what they do can be built upon by others and anything they achieve will really get everyone one step closer and that's what they're trying to do so it matters it very much matters it matters I like that. well dr gonian thank you i think that's a great place to end um if people are interested in purchasing your book or getting a hold of you where, where should they go my website is ruthgotian.com. They can find out everything there. And the book is available wherever you buy books. Um, and if you want to list all over the world, just go to ruthgotian.com slash book. Perfect. Well, I want to thank you very much for this discussion. Uh, it sounded great to me. I've got some tips. I still have some time to be successful, so I'm going to work on it. And thank you for being on The Art of Medicine. Thank you. This program is hosted, edited, and produced by Andrew Wilner, MD, FACP, FAAN. Guests receive no financial compensation for their appearance on the art of medicine. Andrew Wilner, MD, is Associate Professor of Neurology at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center, Memphis, Tennessee. Views, thoughts, and opinions expressed on this program belong solely to Dr. Wilner and his guests and not necessarily to their employers, organizations, or other group or individual. While this program intends to be informative, it is meant for entertainment purposes only. The art of medicine does not offer professional financial, legal, or medical advice. Dr. Wilner and his guests assume no responsibility or liability for any damages, financial or otherwise, that arise in connection with consuming this program's content. Thanks for watching. For more episodes of The Art of Medicine, please subscribe. www.andrewwilner.com